The most unnerving, striking part of Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation, book one of his weird and wild Southern Reach trilogy, are the words. Anyone who's read the book will know what I'm talking about. First found inscribed on the impossible tower slash tunnel that the protagonists find within Area X, the words are a feverish nightmare that blends semi-coherent religious fervor and organic cycles of rot and regrowth. To the characters in this book and trilogy, the words are a shibboleth. They mark those who know them or utter them as being of the contagion of Area X, corrupted indefinably. Indefinable is a good word to keep in mind when you're reading Annihilation. Vandermeer fills the book with uncanny, weird, unsettling descriptions of both the alien and the mundane. The unnamed protagonist, the biologist, sees the world through a lens of fungal growth, decay and birth overlapping and subsuming one another. The book opens with a denial of its own observation. Quote, The tower, which was not supposed to be there, plunges into the earth in a place just before the black pine forest begins to give way to swamp and then the reeds and wind-gnarled trees of the marsh flats. This isn't unreliable narration. It is a clear-eyed protagonist narrating the unreliability of the universe they inhabit. Cryptic words and broken translations permeate the text of Annihilation. The alien at the core of the story is, in effect, a malfunctioning translation machine. It weaves horrors in a constant, growing attempt to mimic and copy a world it was not designed to understand. The titular Annihilation is itself a code word, its meaning employed and revealed at what I found to be the most shocking, horrifying moment of the whole novel, a revelation of the depths to which human language can fail and destroy. Annihilation the film, written and directed by Alex Garland and released in 2018, does not contain that code word moment. It also doesn't contain those zealous, nightmarish words inscribed on the tower. It doesn't even contain the tower, though it compresses some of that place's uncanniness into the lighthouse that does feature in both movie and novel. In fact, Beyond the barest bits of skeleton and framing, Garland's Annihilation is more distant cousin than twin to Vandermeer's Annihilation. This distance was an intentional decision by Garland. Quote, I said to Jeff, I don't know how to do a faithful adaptation of your book. I just literally don't know how to do it. And if what you need is a faithful adaptation, then you will need someone else, because I'm not the guy who's going to be able to do that. Both film and novel are better for this distance. I said to friends and anyone else willing to listen at the time, upon my first viewing of the film, that where Garland succeeds more than I imagined possible was in capturing the spirit of the novel without even attempting to capture its literal building blocks. Annihilation the film uses surrealism and sci-fi imagery to explore grief and loss isolation and alienation, the way we are bound up in each other and by ties that are both inextricable and delicate, innate and separable. It is filled with silences that are impossible in a novel, echoes and strange plot beats that would read as errors on the page, ambiguities and darknesses that would feel like cheating if portrayed in text. Garland uses the language of cinema to explore the inexplicable and to amplify the psychological horror. He uses incredible visuals to detail the patterns of interlaced organism that take the form of many of the book's meditative, monologuing passages. The book makes a meal out of describing things in a way that makes them impossible to visualize, looping grammar and rhetoric to make uncanniness omnipresent. The swamp monster in the book may just be a gargantuan crocodile, but the way it's described makes it hard to decipher its shape and which parts of it are grafted on wrong, like a Frankenstein's monster crafted by a blind, frothing, insane doctor. There's also an uncanny crocodile in the film, but I want to focus on the movie's other nightmare monster. 
Although we see it only in darkness and terrible swiftness, its physical form is describable, because it has to be, because we're viewers. But Garland infuses it with the book's incomprehensible power through a blend of that visual technique, darkness, quickness, dizziness, and perhaps the most frightening, unexpected sound design I've ever encountered in a film. The most present monster in the books exists as disturbing background radiation, emitting a low moaning at all times. The skeletal bear monster of the film met most fully at a climactic moment after it has already killed one of the crew. Instead, speaks with both the guttural snarl of a defaced beast and the pitched, anguished scream of that killed crew member. The first time you hear it is first alarming for the recognition of the voice, then worse for the understanding that follows. The creature is now amalgamation. Like the rest of this hallucinatory metaphor world that Garland has built, it is a shambles of death and unwanted rebirth, a forced recycling of grief and pain, an unbound phantasm of human suffering. The horrific triumph of this creation and this moment in the film, like so many more in its second and third acts, would have been impossible if Garland had not begun by discarding most of his source material. He treats the plot beats of the book as inspiration at best, and uses the stray pieces he can amplify or render well within his chosen medium. After all, as much as the book-to-film pipelines of the modern franchise film universe era may have you believe, a novel is not a screenplay, and even a film is not a literal translation of words to pictures. Unless it's 1962 and you are making the film to kill a mockingbird, it is always a mistake to treat a novel as a detailed blueprint for the production of audiovisual media. Annihilation is the best example I can think of where a book leans on the strengths of its own medium in ways that are not translatable without some creative license, but it's more intrinsic than that. Prose fiction has at least two huge, unique qualities that more or less cannot be translated well into film. Internalization and time dilation. Internal monologue is a huge part of most fiction, in a way that feels corny and unnecessary when rendered as voiceover in an adaptation. It's necessary to prose because there is no human face to read and recognize in that medium. It's redundant and tedious in film because actors and visuals do that work more evocatively. But it's a Venn diagram, not a circle. A monologue in fiction can be effective and elegant and robust in capturing a character's internal conflict, their self-contradiction, their tangled and shifting motivations, far more than a voiceover in film. This is because a moment or two in a fiction book can be rendered as dozens of pages if an author wants to. Virginia Woolf is the author who first comes to mind as exemplary of this. Books like Mrs. Dalloway spend long, long passages on a character's thoughts within a single footstep of an outdoor stroll. Comic books do this too, though in a way that comes off more like cheating than it does in prose, with an action scene of two characters with fists clenched blurting huge paragraphs at each other ahead of the collision. Film can't hold on a moment like this without being obvious about it, whether through freeze frame or slow motion or extended dream slash hallucination sequence. And in all cases, the audience will feel that dilation more so than in a book, where the relative muddiness of moment-to-moment -moment action is an accepted aspect of the form. The thing to remember is that none of this is to the detriment of either or any medium. When creating a piece of art, the first consideration should be how your audience will interact with that art. Decisions about its construction follow from that understanding. This is not to say that art is mere communication, but rather that it is always in some way interactive, and many points of interaction are unique to each given medium. Think of it like sports. If the novel is badminton, the film is racquetball. 
At certain angles they look similar, but the differences are just as immediate and obvious. You could try to play racquetball with a shuttlecock, or badminton with a racquetball racket, and you might even be able to put something resembling either game together. But it wouldn't go well, and you're going to confuse and frustrate yourself and a lot of people along the way. Speaking of confusing and frustrating, I've never seen a piece of art vanish from public consciousness like Game of Thrones, which ended a titanic run with the loudest, wettest thud ever aired. Still, though the discourse has come and gone regarding the disappointment and failure of the series, I think it's worth noting where the extended Game of Thrones adaptation of George R.R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book saga was at its most and least successful. I think the show peaked around season 3, which culminates in the Red Wedding and ends somewhere around the middle of the plotline of Martin's third book, and the show's still going strong into season 4, which ends around the end of that same book. At this period of the show, there is still a lot of complicating plot thread to gather up from the book series, so the series is still expanding on and adding shades to its universe. At the same time, many adaptation decisions were shrewd and clever, removing redundancies or detritus from the books that worked in that medium but would have clunked on screen. Let's pick out a couple, and bear in mind that I didn't really like the books, and reading them felt like a chore, so my memories of them are largely hazy and Wikipedia-assisted at this point. Also, I'm not going to watch Thrones again in any detail. I waste enough of my life as it is. Rob Stark is not a point-of-view character at all in the book series. He's a bit of a cipher, seen through the eyes of his mother, and his death at the Red Wedding plays more operatic than intimate. Really, in the book, he's a somewhat abstract, contrasting point to Joffrey, both playing different parts of the Boy Kings Are a Bad Idea thematic runner. His impulsive decision to toss off his arranged marriage is, well, impulsive. As a reader, I didn't feel like I was supposed to root for him, but instead shake my head at the idea that a horny teenager should ever try to make big decisions. The show gets Richard Madden, though, who, while not my favorite actor, does imbue Rob with a lot of apparent integrity and self-seriousness. And his decision is made more sensible, at least on an emotional level, because it's portrayed from his point of view. We see his budding, inadvertent romance with Talisa enough to see it less as a plot point, planted by an author making a pointed observation about the historical record of child monarchs, and more as a character choice among many others, one which leads to horrible consequences. Neither approach is bad, but the show does what makes sense for its particular storytelling, and more importantly, its particular medium, where faces and actors can do so much more with peripheral characters than words would want to attempt. An even better example of that aspect of the adaptation is Oberyn Martell, played in season 4 by a mesmerizing Pedro Pascal. In the books, Oberyn is nothing but a riff on Mandy Patinkin's character Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride, a revenge-obsessed swashbuckler who, in Martin's story, exists in order to not get what he believes he deserves. He is, once again, a cipher with no point-of-view moments. His climactic battle and failure are watched and described by Tyrion, and the emotional beat is more about Tyrion's resulting condemnation than any audience attachment to the Red Viper. In the show, in part because of Pascal, but also because of the writer's deliberate choices, Oberyn is instead a compelling, emotive, lovable character. Adding empathy and acting to this character type makes his failure and death shocking and crushing on its own accord, setting aside Tyrion's fate. It allows the show to turn what is in the book a bit of a punchline, one that leads to but doesn't happen in the final act, into a proper climactic showdown at the penultimate moment of an entire season. Early and mid Game of Thrones is littered with choices like this. Emphasis or de-emphasis on characters or plotlines such that a series of overlong, overcomplicated books 
can be distilled into recognizable character and plot arcs across each season. Then the guide rope ended, and showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Weiss got lost and drowned. Now, based on my earlier discussion of Annihilation, you might think that there are no more books to adapt could and should be a huge asset to a television production. And you'd be correct, at least in theory. But Weiss and Benioff had two things working against them in that respect. Firstly, they had notes from George R.R. R. Martin about where he was expecting the books to end up. And secondly, they had a clear and persistent urge to wrap the show up. Seasons 5 and onward of Game of Thrones eliminates plot threads and character arcs with a fatal eagerness. Sometimes the show does this with a beautiful, compelling flourish, at least in the moment, but then that moment ends, and you realize that an entire swath of interesting characters have been obliterated for the sake of a good musical beat and a decent chunk of CGI budget. Compare that later, ultimately indistinct massacre with The Red Wedding, where every named character's death is meaningful and relevant to the climax. It's not the worst thing the show's done to this point by any stretch, but it's an indication of the rush to resolution that the showrunners have begun. Worse, though, the show reveals its hand on which plotlines and characters matter to it, and which ones do not. Everything involving Bran Stark and the weirdest and most psychedelic aspects of the books gets junked or cut into shards that establish rote flashbacks and important beats for other plots. Cersei literally blows up the entire King's Landing storyline, taking with it any chance to complicate or interrogate its dissection of palace intrigue, religion, populism, or anything outside of the half dozen characters the writers had decided by then were the only linchpins of relevance. Danny's sojourn through Slaver's Bay is chopped up and boiled down into the shortest path possible to get her back to Westeros. This last one is a problem that ends up being part of what kneecaps the show's ending and reveals the bigger problem here. By shortcutting through Danny's odyssey, the show loses the ability to portray her potential failings as a leader and the limits of her dynamic personality and the inescapable contradiction of her free the slaves mentality and her large winged weapons of mass destruction. So when Danny does her now infamous heel turn, the show has to work overtime trying to explain how this makes sense, and ends up making a weird argument that when the people we like kill the bad guys, it's good and okay, but when the scary lady kills them, it's bad actually. Then Cersei gets a bizarre, scared, tragic heroine's death. Arya is given the climactic kill shot on an enemy she has not discussed or cared about at any previous point in the story. And established veteran schemer Littlefinger does some of the worst scheming ever shown on television and is summarily executed by the two literal children who outplayed him. The show hits on these final beats, which probably bear a lot of resemblance to Martin's intended final beats, without doing any of the work to earn them, and so each lands wrong, one after the other. Blame Martin all you want for writing himself into so many corners that he may never even want to write another Ice and Fire book. But the length of those books is both their greatest asset as fantasy world-building treatises, and the reason why Martin always figured they were unfilmable. Characters progress, backslide, disappear for entire books, and meet their fates along recognizable stretches of space and time. The world building is patient. The Siege of Winterfell takes up and doesn't even end within the space of an entire book. Danny is still in Slaver's Bay to this very day. When you're working with a pot this big, the boiling takes a long time. Even without later books to adapt, the failure of Game of Thrones is a failure of adaptation. Treat a novel's plot points like check marks to notch on a list, ignore its pacing and its meditative qualities, and you lose all the flavor and interest of building arcs and climactic moments. Denis Villeneuve's 2021 adaptation of Dune which I believe is the third filmed or televised adaptation of Herbert's 1965 sci-fi classic, takes a literal approach to its treatment of the source material 
and somewhat like Benioff and Weiss, loses some of the flavor as a result. Dune, for those who have not read it, is first and foremost a weird story. Quick caveat, I do not like the book. I'll get into why in a minute. The 2021 film's opening narration mentions that the spice harvested on the semi-titular Arrakis is critical for space navigation. What it does not mention, and what is not mentioned anywhere in the film's text, is that it is critical because it's apparently a lot easier to navigate the stars when you're high on space LSD. The psychotropic properties of spice are mentioned in a single line in Dune the 2021 film. Those properties only affect the movie's protagonist, Paul, and exist as a plot device to fuel or explain some straightforward dream sequences and to emphasize his whole Chosen One mythic arc. The Harkonnens, too, aren't grim, dark, pale-faced bad guys in Herbert's rendition. They're a grimy, tacky, sleazebag drug cartel. Think Jabba the Hutt, not Darth Vader. But their weirdness is desaturated in Villeneuve's film, where they become subhuman, alien, weirdo monsters with little nuance. Stellan Skarsgård does his best to give his barons some degree of scheming intellect and odd mannerisms, but he's eating off a paltry plate. Other, more interested Dune fans could tell you a lot of other things, excised from the film, that are central to understanding how weird and wild 60s sci-fi could get. But let's leave it there for now and get into something more relevant to our discussion of adaptation. How the book executes on its constructed messiah plot. To my frustration while reading the book, Dune starts most chapters with passages from a journal or academic text written long after the events in that chapter would have ended. These passages tend to spoil or reveal things about characters that we will otherwise learn within the actual text. Who dies, who betrays, who will succeed and who will fail in both their short-term and long-term ambitions. I hated this as a reader, but I understood what it was doing in concert with the book's throughline of the Bene Gesserit, who engineer history through breeding programs and careful socialization. Paul Atreides is the messiah of myth on Arrakis because the myth was planted and written by the Bene Gesserit. It's easier to fulfill the prophecy when you write it than when you are more powerful than all the players in the tale. This is both literal to the plot and a clever bit of meta-commentary. Hero's journeys are Luke's Skywalker and Harry's Potter, are fictional constructions. When they seem to exist in the real world, that is the work of propaganda and societal facade. Governments especially of the autocratic or fascist varieties, thrive on simple stories about deserving individuals of greatness. And so we find these tales told again and again, seldom challenged for their artificiality. I liked this critique better in theory than in practice, because reading a book structured this way sucks all the dramatic tension out of scenes and character interactions. The Dune is doing this while detailing every weird bit of terminology and giving Paul his 7th or 8th hard to pronounce messianic title made the slog that much deeper and thicker. Villeneuve loses some of the power of echoing this theme, but the artificiality of Paul's ascension is still present in this film. And what Villeneuve adds to that is the scale and awe of entire worlds built around such apocalyptic and religious fervor. His Dune is a movie of vast scale and thunderous portent. It's been criticized for being humorless, but I find it hard to criticize a movie for that when humor is as far from its aims as possible. Dune, at least in this first part, isn't analyzing the monomyth like a scholar or an author using characters as mouthpieces for extended monologues. It's constructing the monomyth before our eyes, trying to immerse and drown us in the overwhelming significance of such a thing as driving the fates of billions, trillions of people across countless generations and worlds. If Frank Herbert's Dune asks why about the hero's journey, then Villeneuve's Dune asks what and how, and answers with a scale of production and design that makes most of the Star Wars movies look like puppet shows. Is this better? 
or worse? Is it more interesting? Sure, it's less varied and psychedelic and philosophical than Herbert's work, but Villanoe never tries to pull huge chunks of variety or psychedelics or philosophy from that book. He pulls its spectacles and its operatic movements and builds around those with the language of film to create a mythos worth interrogating in the first place. It's a different success from Herbert's book, and that's all you should ever want or hope for from adaptations like this, really. They can and should succeed on their own terms, as independent works, the expression of another artist or a collaboration of artists using different materials from the other. These discussions are so often zero-sum. Is the book better than the movie? Is the movie better than the video game? That's an uninteresting question to me. Good, powerful films are often good and powerful for reasons that are untranslatable to prose. Poetry can work without needing strictures of sentence grammar or narrative arcs. Music affects us without needing story or dialogue or scene construction or even words at all. Each has its own language its own phraseology, aspects of craftsmanship and granularity unique to its own production. If latter Game of Thrones is bad, it's not because of how it deviates from its source material, but because it's slapdash about character arcs and lazy with the execution of its bullet point narrative beats. If Alex Garland's Annihilation is a success, it's because Garland had something to say about grief and death and the human condition and used the metaphor of film to say it. And not because he didn't include the crawler or the tower, or because he did include Vandermeer's lighthouse and the book protagonist's occupation as a biologist. We should be capable, as audience members, of celebrating or criticizing or at least observing each work on its own intentions and mechanics. We often are at least whenever we walk into a movie having not read the graphic novel it's based on, or start a new television show without knowing about the last time someone made a show with that name. When Stephen King wrote It, he based it at least in part on an old Norwegian fairy tale about goats and a bridge troll. He also based it on whatever was running through his head during the depths of a cocaine addiction. He also based it on the fact that he thinks the scariest possible thing to a child is a clown. My heart goes out to all professional clowns. I have no idea why you do what you do, given what everyone thinks of you. And I think that makes you the real heroes. We don't judge King's It on its fidelity to that Norwegian tale. Which goats are represented by which kids? Is the bridge troll doing troll things? And we shouldn't judge the 2017 film adaptation of It on whether its version of Pennywise acts or looks like your head's version of Pennywise while you're reading the book. Like what you like, hate what you hate. Your feelings and reactions as a viewer are valid because they're internal. No Metacritic score or starred review or scathing tweet affects that. If, for example, you loved season eight of Game of Thrones, I respect that and I also envy you. Adaptation does not leave an umbilical cord that requires one to approach both parent and child as equal parts of the whole. It's a piece of inspiration, a first stitch in the fabric of a new quilt, and you don't need to notice one stitch to appreciate the blanket. <laughs>